This is Dylan FM, a freak music club podcast on Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place. This season, we're going deep on Time Out of Mind to celebrate its 25th anniversary. Here's your host, Craig Danielov. For a long time, the best news a music fan could hear was that one of their favorite albums was being remastered. This was done a lot once CDs took over, and the record companies wanted to give us all even more reasons to repurchase things we already owned and loved. A remaster is a new version of an old album. The finished tapes are prepared, usually using far better technology than the first time, for commercial reproduction and distribution. There can be sonic differences, but generally the goal is exactly as it was, only better. A remix is something more dramatic. When an album is remixed, the source track recordings are used, the individual instruments and vocal takes. And these individual tracks can, and often are, modified and then recombined in potentially different ways. And then the combined new result is adjusted in any one of a thousand ways, and then the whole thing gets mastered anew for reproduction and distribution. This is not exactly as it was, only better. Well, it could be that, but it doesn't have to be that. So a remaster is a cleanup, but a remix is, potentially, a complete rebuild. Our guest today was handed the master tapes for Time Out of Mind a little over a year ago and asked to remix it, to build a new version from the source parts for this award-winning and deeply loved album. The result of his work is being released tomorrow on the Bootleg Series Volume 17, Fragments, The Time Out of Mind Sessions. Michael Brower is a New York-based mix engineer with an incredible resume. His credits include Aretha Franklin, The Rolling Stones, Bruce Springsteen, Paul McCartney, and Elvis Presley, to name just a few. The release notes include a much longer list. He's won seven Grammys. He's also worked on eight major Bob Dylan albums before this one, and you'll hear about those. And you'll also hear clearly that he's a huge Bob Dylan fan who deeply understands the responsibility he holds in doing this job and what the original recordings mean to all of us, as well as the potential for improving, or in this case, reimagining them. He is also very well known and respected, of course, in the mixing world, and he's built plugins that others use to mix and he teaches mixing, both in person and online. I spoke to Michael last week from his upstate New York studio. We talked about what he was asked to do with Time Out of Mind, how he approached it, what he did, and the results he's achieved. This is a side of the music world that we often don't get to look at very closely. And although it's a technical process, this is a conversation about passion, the feelings of the songs, and the Dylan songs in particular bring, and the impact of voice and the totality of the album and its legacy. If you're hearing this, you're on the public feed of our podcast. Premium members get an extended version of all of our shows, and in this case, that's an extra 40 minutes of conversation, as well as the option to watch the video of the interview, which I would highly recommend. Check the show notes for details about becoming a premium member. You'll be able to listen to the longer episodes right in your current podcast player, or watch the videos on our website. Join now, and you can go back and hear the extended versions and watch the videos for the 20 interviews we've done about Time Out of Mind before this one. Plus, becoming a member makes it possible for us to do these interviews. We have no advertising. This is a fan-run project that needs your support. And now, here's our discussion with Michael Brower about the Time Out of Mind 2022 remix. So it's an amazing pleasure and privilege to have you here, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It'll be a, a fun time today. Yeah. So l- let's start with your background with Dylan, because you've done a lot of Dylan, and, and this is by no means your first bootleg series uh, mix even. No, uh, I've been, I, I met Steve Berkowitz. Well, I've known Steve Berkowitz for many, many years. He was at Legacy. And um, yeah, he hired me for the first bootleg that was, um, oh, it's right over here. What is it? It's 66. The, I think you did. It's first. A 66. Yeah. I'm looking at the award. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was the first 
challenge. Boy, if I had the technology that I, you know, I have today back then, it would have probably taken a bit less time and and not as frustrating. But still, yeah. So I've done many many projects that were usually either projects that had never been mixed, you know, where maybe just roughs have been released, or um, you know, they're remixing it in an SACD format and um, each one was a challenge of its own, but really, really fun. Yeah. Well, let me list them. So you did uh, bootleg series four live 66 bootleg series five live 75 bootleg series six, which is 64, the Halloween concert, which is like my favorite show in all of history. So it's just amazing to, um, to get to listen to that seven, the no direction home box set. Um, the Bring It All Back Home remix for the 2003 re-releases um, and the SACD for that. I also want to ask you more about, about SACD later. Uh, the Blonde on Blonde remix for 2003. And, and, that was um, incredible. Yeah. I, I, well, the problem with talking about Dylan is there's every angle you can go down and every avenue you can go down and talk about for an hour, but I'm going to try to get to time out of mind today, but it's, great that you did that you did love sick so you touched time out of mine earlier you did the victoria's secret mix um it, one thing i saw somewhere but then it didn't seem like i could verify it were you involved in street legal in any way in the yeah i mixed a remix street legal too so was it the 99 remix when it got yeah. really redone or was that something oh yeah so with don devito he, he you work you were a partner with him somehow because his name um, is the one i saw well he's He's the executive. He's A and R. He was A and R. Oh, but you did it. Okay. Yeah, Don DeVito is in the mixer. Okay. Sorry, I just I, I read no, it somewhere. No it didn't have the credits. It didn't have the credits right. That, so you did that. Oh, that's another one. Uh, I, a lot of these, what I want to ask you after watching a bunch of your stuff and how you're what you're able to do now with new tools to you know rip stems out and do all this miraculous stuff is whether some of those old projects now you feel like you could do more and it'd be interesting to go back to. I don't think I could do it any better, for sure. And oh, it'd just the be only, easier for the, you. Yeah, I think it'd been easier to get to where I wanted to get to. Um, oh. But there was only one project where I only had a stereo to mix to work with, right? And and that was the first project that, you know, when when Dylan decides to go electric. That was the only one where I had basically a stereo instrumental and a vocal so it was three track and right. yeah that's a whole story in its in its own of of the journey that i got to the point where i i was i got you know chills all right all right well so that's a big pile of dylan projects that you've done what's your personal history with dylan you know just as a listener as a fan before all that or even just like everybody else 20 year you know, period. i mean i you know as i was growing up you could either listen to bob or the stones or the beatles right or any of those bands that were out there at the same time because i was growing up with all of that as they were growing up and um you know just dylan was just far and away on a, on a completely different road than anybody else. And it was funny. It's like, you know, if you were against the rules, you tended to like the stones more than, you know, than maybe the Beatles. And if you were getting into trouble, you found people say, are you listening to the stones? Are you listening to, you know, I don't think Dylan ever sat into any of those, you know, you're a good boy or a bad boy, but um, it was really, of course it was ridiculous, but um, I listened to everybody and, and like anyone else, I mean, I I've had opportunity to, to mix two of the three artists that I've just mentioned and, and even the third one individuals from the band. So it was, you know, to, to be a guy who's like, I, in a band playing these songs or just sitting back and just listening to these songs and then one day having your hands on it. I mean, that's why most of us become mixers. I mean, there is just nothing in the world like, you know, finally getting to mix 
an artist that you know you've had so much love with and you have so many memories from as you're growing up so it was it was very very special cool and yet i have never met bob i've never been in the same studio of course since i've never met him um i've never spoken to him i have no idea what he's thinking or whether he's ever liked it i assume that if he didn't like it he i'd probably hear about it but i can't assume that either right I'm not going to assume wow. or dictate what he's thinking, right? Because that would be pretty stupid. So, but, um, you know, if somebody from the camp hated what I was doing, I would have heard about it. But, you know, yeah, quite you're, often, you're almost was, 10 projects in now. Yeah. So I think at this point, you know, I'm probably okay. But, um, you know, Steve Berkowitz was always, you know, the one who represented the, you know, the camp pretty much of the direction of what, what needed to be done. So, um, it was, you know, it was just an incredible, incredible year. I mean, to start with, you know, with, with just this iconic show where he, you know, the first set he's acoustic. And then the second set, his guys from the band, you know, or the future band comes on. And he goes electric and everybody's going ballistic. What is this? You know, and other people are going, this is amazing. <laughs> and I'm mixing this. You know, I'm like, oh, my God, this is it. This was the night, you know. Well, let's move. Let's jump forward to Time Out of Mind and the, and the new fragments, uh, the new mix. So there's, there's a lot there because, obviously, this is really the first time, you know, Self-Portrait got redone in, in, in a way, in the Self-Portrait box. But to, to take an album that's this a loved and be yeah. um, iconic in its own way and, and remix it. it you know, it's really a big issue. And I want to, you know, hear a little bit more about what you know about the thoughts of even taking on that project and, and doing it this way. I, I will say I've, I've been able to listen for uh, almost two weeks now. Um, I just love it. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting in a bunch of ways. It's interesting because it's cleaner and brighter and there's just this, you know, sort of haze lifted in some ways. There's instruments that you didn't hear before. There's all kinds of changes that we'll talk about that are really great. And yet it doesn't feel like a different album. That's um, right. There you, it's, you nailed it. It's really amazing. Even, you know, I, after I listened to it for a while and I went back to the old one and then I made myself a playlist with both albums and I put it on shuffle to try to see if I could tell. and it's not easy. There's some tracks that's easy. We'll talk about the difference because I think some tracks are pretty subtle, the differences, and some tracks are more dramatic. But it's great that the what I'm saying is a compliment, that the feel didn't change. Yep. That's if you right. think about the new one and you dive in, especially I think, you know, either sort of more critical listening and maybe more better environment, there's tons of new stuff and it's really great. Um, and, and yet you never think, you know, it's different. So anyway, I, I just want to tell you how much I love it. Um, Thank you. Before we started talking about it. But what you said is, is really important. And that was going to be my approach. I am one of those fans that hates a record that has been reinvented, remixed. When I grew up with every note, every feel, ev the whole emotion is attached to that record. It's not just the songs. It's the time in my life, right? And so we all have that, that feel that we're getting from a record. And if you take that away and you go into some other technical, or it, to me it's technical, where you, you just change the environment, you change the approach, um, I hate it. I go, I, I just turn it off because I'll just call it bullshit, right? And so... I am not going to do that to my. I am not going to do that with a record that's iconic. There is nothing wrong with Time Out of Mind. What Daniel Lenoir did and Bob was brilliant. It's obvious it was brilliant because it just put Bob basically back where he should be, right? right. So, so when we've when we've been listening to that record, we know how it feels. I am not going to be the guy who changes that feel. I don't I want to feel that humid 
midsummer, just dripping wet, almost you know, New Orleans kind of swampy darkness, right? At times, and other times, just this pain that he has in his voice. And, you know, so I'm like, okay. Um, when, when I was approached to it, I said, look, you know, and they said, look, we know, we know what you're going to do because we've heard you do other stuff for Bob. We, we want to hear your interpretation of it. And we, but we want to keep it a little bit more simple, a little bit more singer songwriter approach. And I thought, okay, but on some, I said, okay, and but the emotion, the feeling, the things that the certain hooks that we all have lived with must be retained. But I'll bring the story out a little bit more. I'll bring, you know, I'll, I'll be able to, I think. Find an approach where you're still getting all of that. You're maintaining the integrity of, of each song and you're getting the feel, but then I'll bring out the story a little bit better. And when I say better, I mean as an alternative approach, okay? There's nothing to be done that is better from what is already great. So I'll just use it in the yeah. sense of, of that approach. And then. I think if it's done properly, you might just hear the story tied together a little bit better because Bob is telling a story, right? And I think that that maybe um, I can do it in a way so that it starts to tie tie together. And um, and so that was my initial thought. I was like, I'll I'll do it with that in mind, if you know. And then I said, if you're looking for something where, you know, I just go like crazy with it and stuff, I, I'm not going to do that because that'll be the first record that I would turn off. And I'm not going there. That's, if you see right. my discography, as you know it, I'm into it from a musical standpoint. And, you know, and I, I, I want to respect, especially an iconic record, because those are, those are tough to ever want to touch. Right. So I knew that those would have to be the conditions. Let's let me tell you how how this whole thing, how what I had in front of me, yeah. because I haven't heard the track yet. So I'm assuming that that what I get will be the stems of what you're hearing. Right. If I put all the tracks up, I'm hearing the mix. And then, of course, you know, the challenge is, well, how much processing am I? do I have? Did Danielle print uh, the effects right on the vocal? Did he print a lot of the cool stuff that he was doing? Is that printed or was that done at the mix? Right? Because if it's done at the mix, then I have flexibility. If it's all, ex- you know, I put up the tracks and, and the, you know, it's, it's processed and it's got all that stuff, then I have very little room. Right? So I put up the tracks and of course, C. Berkowitz has this, he's like a Sherlock Holmes, but he was able to find all of them. And almost on, on all, except for maybe one song, all the tracks that appear in the mix are on the multi-track. There was one song where the intro has a hook. It was nowhere to be found. And I was like, well, I'm not mixing this song without that. Because if I were to hear this, I would go, the fuck? <laughs> now, what, you think you're cool to not to have the main hook going in this song, right? So I basically just extracted it from the record, from the stereo mix, the guitar, right, with Isotope. Yeah. Now I just had my guitar line. I laid that into, into the multi-track and then off and running, right? There's... There's nothing that can't be done, and and there's just no way that there's going to have to be an asterisk to explain why something isn't right. And I don't do that. I just figured it out. So to clarify, you found that most of the effects weren't printed on the tape. You kind of had the raw tapes from everyone's. And if they were if they were printed, they were printed separately. So if there were effects maybe on the vocal, 
the vocal was dry, but he had printed some of the effects on the side, right? But I think okay. that on most of the songs, um, the the direction was more to to get the vocal to be a little bit, and I can't really say drier, but just to be a little more presentable in the sense of it being a little bit more natural. Okay. So I had that freedom because it wasn't printed, you know, with all right. the reverb or the delays or stuff. I, I could create all of that. And then at times when I wanted to match exactly what Danielle had done, I could just listen to it because I'm running the stereo mix in at the same time of the multi-track. So at any point, I'm always a being, and I was a being for hours because here's, here's the issue that I had. When I put up the track, as I was saying earlier, I was expecting to hear just what was record, what was printed on the stereo. No, 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 no. What I have is five to six guitar playing all the time from soup to nuts. Two keyboards, dobro, slide guitars, percussion, organ, Rhodes, you know, um, and parts. I mean, just all of those. And I was like, okay, because some producers, they, they arrange everything right in the moment, right? They decide on the arrangement, who's going to play what in what section, who's not going to be playing. And then what you're, what you get is was their creation of, of their arrangements. And then there's other producers who just say, look, everybody play. Here's the vibe we want. You play your thing. You play your thing. You play your thing. Everybody's playing. And then I'll decide at, at the time of the mix what stays and what goes. And that was the case. So. You had to I'm rebuild listening. it, basically. So I had to rebuild it. But the remember, I want to capture everything that I loved about that I heard in the original record, right? So certain guitar lines, certain vocal effects, or certain, all the little things that, that I want to hear, I have to find those. And then, and, and so what I would do is I would start with the intro. And I would go through, I would just play the intro over and over and over. First four bars or eight bars. And I'm going through every track and hearing those, listening, memorizing them, and then deciding who are those that I like. And then and then I'll go to the to the Danielle's mix and I'll go, what did he decide on? And I'll go, okay, well, that's like really close to what I did. Okay, cool. I know, I know, I know what those tracks are. So for that first eight bars, we agree, right? But then I'll hear something that's really, really cool that could maybe enhance that section that wasn't on the record. So for now, I'll say, okay, everything that I don't like in this section, I'm going to mute. Start off that way. I'm just going to, I'm just going with my instinct. I'm not second guessing anybody. I'm not trying to think who likes what, who doesn't. I don't care about any of that because you can never win in that. I'm just making me happy as a fan. So I'll decide what I like and what I don't like. And then I'll just check with, with Lenoir's mix and go, okay, how far off am I? Okay, we're cool. Oh, wow, I didn't hear that. Where is that? And then I'll look for that little part. I go, okay, I got that. That was only like in the whole song, there was only two bars, you know, from that particular performance. Right? I was like, okay, so I'll unmute that. And then I'll go to the first verse. Same thing. And then the second verse and the B sec, you know, move on. And, you know, these are not three minute songs, right? So, you know, especially the one that's 15 minutes. And so I just keep going through all of that till, till I'm done right to the end. So really it's a pre-production it's pre-mixing, right? So once I've done all that and I'm like, okay, um, now, now let me just start mixing all those ingredients and see where I'm at. And Again, one of the directions that I was given is keep it simple. 
make it simpler than the original record, but still try and retain everything. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, then I start mixing and I'm thinking, okay, how do I feel? Do I feel that, that emotional stress, you know, the sadness? Am I, am I getting that really hot, humid, you know, August day from this? Is that, is it swampy enough, but not too busy? You know, and so that would always lead me to decide which direction to go in, right? And then at the point where finally I go, I get from the beginning to the end, and I'm like, okay, this is cool. And I'm muting stuff because even with what I love now, I can't have all that playing all the time, right? So I had to start removing stuff. That's why sometimes you'll hear like a bass pull out. Like, you know what? This is a good time to turn the bass off. This is like, this really just puts the highlight on that, on that verse on what he's trying to say. I, we don't need a bass right there, right? So I would take that liberty because, you know, at, at worst, Steve would say, I don't know, that doesn't make sense to me. Or, you know, we could discuss it and, and then I'll just put it back in if I needed to. But the, it was rare that that he would do that. If anything, he'd want more taken out, <laughs> you know, take more out. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> you know, so... So this went on, I'd get through the song and then I would just listen to it. And then I would listen to Danielle's mix from beginning to end and see how, now all I'm doing is a feel thing. And am I missing anything important hooks? Like it, are the things that, that I remember about this song, because I have to refresh my memory on this, right? What about it is it that, that really was, what are the most important elements in here that made me feel the way I do? And then I go back to my mix and I'm like, you know, if I didn't get that field, then I just dig back in and just keep doing things until it felt right. It had to be an enhanced feel of what we've all lived with. That was basically, you know, the, uh, the direction. Yeah. And I think that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, those extra, the extra instruments, you know, a lot of times to me, well, I want to talk about the voice and the vocal treatment. Primarily what this does is it brings those instruments forward. The voice was much further forward above everyone, and everyone else was kind of in a little ball in the back of the room before. And it feels like you've kind of expanded them and, and clarified them. And there are, you know, hi-hats and bass parts that are much more dramatic. It's interesting that the vocal stays still ahead. It's not, you know, Bob's never gets pushed back at all but these other guys seem way up and let's talk about Dylan's vocal for a second. So I thought the vocal happily was remarkably consistent. It's a little clearer. There's a little, you know, haze or, or fog off of it. I don't know what the technical term is, but it's, it's clear to me, but it's not, you know, it's not radically different. Obviously that would be, as you were talking about a big thing that would really change this if his vocal you know, sounded different. Um, it would Mark distract us, right? It would distract yeah. us from him telling the story. And and we all know how Bob's voice should sound. I mean, since I've done many of these, you know, so we want that. We all want that. There were times when I would hear the original mix and it was 60, 60 amp and 30, you know, or 40 of the natural. And the comment, so I would, kind of go in that direction and the comment would come back as no too much amp we want you know 80 natural and 20 amp i said okay so in the process of doing that then i would see well how can i still feel kind of like that and that's how i would treat the delays or the reverb and maybe get them a little more excitement so you're still getting the essence of it but in a more natural way which would make the vocal more articulate Right. And so when you're saying the clarity, it's like, well, if I don't have that distortion going on, then you're, it's going to it's going to sound a lot more articulate, clear. But on the other hand, I don't want it to sound flat and uninteresting. So, you know, right. Every song was you know, a set of its own challenges, which 
which is the most obvious one. Um, Cold Iron's bound, right? I mean, that's where you really hear the bass and the drums just driving the song more. And that, you know, there were times where it, the difference between the original and what I had done was not subtle. But on the other hand, it's because I felt that the story was more aggressive. And it just that's all we have time for on this episode. But the discussion goes on for another 40 minutes. See the show notes for a link you can use to upgrade and immediately get both the longer version and access to the video. Here's a sample of some of the extended conversation. You know, if I got it too close to the way it was done on the record, you know, they're looking for a much more natural approach, much more of a storytelling approach. I really wanted the band to be wrapped around him a bit more. That nastiness needed to come out. I mean, you would have to ask Daniel Lenoir what he would what he would have done differently. And so, and it was in those moments where I would just check myself and go, all right, am I enhancing what I remember? But you got to be careful with that because that could be the vibe of this, of that mix. And you take that out and suddenly you just go, what's happening here? Something just changed. I just didn't want to be that guy where somebody goes, I hate these mixes. It's just a whole other thing. Don't forget to subscribe and rate this podcast. It really helps. For bonus episodes and more, become a member at freakmusic.club slash join. And you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at FMC underscore Dylan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.